Hello everyone, good morning. I'm Kayin from MSC, currently working in the CMC International Team in APEC under the Global Regulatory Affairs and Clinical Safety Organization. I'm also honored to be one of the industry experts in the Implementation Working Group for ICHQ5A R2 representing IFPMA. I apologize for not being able to join you all in person today due to family commitment. Nevertheless, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to address such an esteemed audience through this recorded video presentation. I trust that this presentation will contribute meaningfully to providing key highlights on the major updates in the revision 2 of this ICHQ 5A guidance on viral safety evaluation of biotechnology products derived from cell line of human or animal origin. Please note that the views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of myself and they shall not be understood or cited as opinion of my organization or ICH experts. I would also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the ICH Q5 AR2 IWG member for their contributions to the content presented. Additionally, the materials provided in this slide deck have been adapted from the ICH website. In the next few slides, I will be sharing insights on the key updates in the revision 2 of the ICHQ5A guidance. To begin, I will provide an overview of the history and development of this guidance, followed by a slide summarizing the key updates. After that, I will dive into each segment in more details. There will be four key updates that I'm going to cover in today's session. They are new product types, new test method and testing facilities, prior knowledge and continuous manufacturing. Finally, I will discuss what can be expected in the future from the Implementation Working Group. Since the publication of the Q5A Revision 1 guideline in 1999, significant advances in biotechnology product development and manufacturing has occurred. Improved technologies for virus detection and quantifications have emerged and the strategies for virus clearance have evolved based on manufacturing experience and scientific consensus. Only a limited number of validation approaches for virus clearance are described that can be currently applied. Recognizing the need to reflect these advancements, it was acknowledged that an update to the guidance was necessary to encompass new product types, the advances in manufacturing technology, including analytical methods for virus testing, and the scientific knowledge gathered to date. The final concept paper and business plan for revision 2 were endorsed by the management committee in November 2019, and the draft revised guidance was released for public consultation almost, almost three years later in September 2022. Finally, the final version was adopted in November 2023. The revision in the ICHQ5A R2 retains key principles of the original guideline and provides additional recommendations on the established and complementary approaches to control the potential viral contamination of biotechnology products. It also describes the evaluation of the viral safety of biotech products, including viral clearance and testing, and outlines what data should be submitted in marketing applications of, for these products. Details on the key updates can be found in the Step 4 presentation for the revision on the ICH website, as indicated in the slide here. I have extracted this table of contents from the Step 4 document available on the ICH websites under the ICHQ5 AR2. It actually summarizes the extent of changes in the respective sections. As you may have seen, most sections have undergone major changes. In Section 1, documents include expanded scope description. For Section 3 and 4 on cell line qualification and testing for viruses for unprocessed bout, new test method as well as testing flexibilities has also been introduced. In the Section 5 on rationale and action plan for viral clearance studies and viral tests on purified bout, a new case F is being included to describe when the production virus is used in the production of a product. 
under section 6, we have also included a new subsections on the applications of prior knowledge for evaluation and characterization of viral clearance procedures. And the brand new section 7 is introduced to cover the points to consider for continuous manufacturing. There has been also new terms introduced in this revision and they are being included in section 9 under glossary. For annexes, there are two new annexes being introduced in this revision. Annex 5, which covers the examples of prior knowledge, including in-house experience to reduce product-specific validation effort. The new Annex 6 includes the specific considerations for the new product types for genetically engineered viral vectors and viral vector derived products. In this slide, I will be sharing the four key updates in this revision. First off, the guideline has expanded the scope to include new product types amenable to viral clearance, such as genetically engineered viral vectors and viral vector derived products, to acknowledge the evolving landscape of biotechnology products. Next, the introduction of new test methods as well as the testing flexibilities driven by advancement in analytical techniques such as next generation sequencing, NGS, and nucleic acid amplification techniques. These new methods provide enhanced capabilities for detecting and characterizing viral contaminants. The third major update focuses on the introduction of alternative virus clearance validation strategies, emphasizing the utilization of prior knowledge for validation. This shift recognizes the value of accumulated knowledge and experience in assessing viral clearance and encourages a more adaptable approach. Lastly, the revised guideline elaborates on virus clearance validation and risk mitigation strategies for continuous manufacturing, taking into account the unique considerations and challenges of continuous production processes. The landscape of biotechnology product has experienced a remarkable transformation in the last two decades driven by the advancement of new product technologies and biomanufacturing platforms. This has led to the development of innovative products such as virus-like particles, subunits, proteins, and viral vector products for vaccines and gene therapies using novel mammalian and insect-based vectors or cell expression systems. For some of these products, clearance of viral vector and advantageous agents may need to be demonstrated. The visual chemical properties of known and potential viruses for the species of cell line origin needs to be considered in selection of appropriate viruses for the clearance studies. Revision 2 of ICHQ5A has included genetically engineered viral vectors and viral vector derived products provided they are amenable to viral clearance without negative impact on the product. This expansion encompasses a wide array of innovative products such as specular virus express VLPs and protein subunits, nanoparticle-based protein vaccines and therapeutics, as well as adeno-associated virus vector, both with and without production virus or helper viruses, and they may be applied in vivo or ex vivo. Besides inactivated viral vaccines and light attenuated viral vaccines containing self-replicating agents are excluded from the scope of these guidelines, in the new revisions, cell therapies are also out of scope of this guideline. However, the principle may be used as applicable for biological starting or raw materials. The new revision also brought forth new terms on production virus, which is a process-related virus that may encompass a helper virus or a viral vector for protein expression. A helper virus provides crucial functions that enable an otherwise replication-deficient co-infecting virus to replicate, while a Viral vector for protein expression, such as specular virus, serves as a powerful tool for expressing recombinant proteins or producing viral like particles. In previous version, Section 5 illustrated 
the rationale and action plan for viral clearance studies and virus tests on purified bulk using various cases from case A to case E. In the new version, new case F has been included to describe when a production virus is used in the production of a product, where clearance of the virus should be demonstrated using the production virus or a specific model virus. Testing for the absence of the production virus should be performed for each purified bulb unless justified by robust excess clearance. It is important to note that testing of at least three batches of purified bulb is expected to confirm the absence of residual production virus. Additionally, a new Annex 6 was also introduced to provide specific guidance on genetically engineered viral vectors and viral vectors derived product. This new Annex detailed the important considerations on testing for viruses and outlined the virus tests that should be performed at various stages during productions for virus seed, unprocessed bulk, and purified bulk drug substance. It also covers the important considerations on virus clearance of the new product. For example, viral clearance should be evaluated using representative and qualified scaled down models, and the virus clearance studies should include the production virus itself or a specific model virus, for example, vacular virus or adenovirus, and model viruses representative of adventitious and endogenous viruses. Moving on to our second key update on new test methods and testing facilities. The new revision encourages the use of new alternative tests, including next generation sequencing, the NGS, and polymerized chain reaction, PCR, which is one of the nuclear acid amplification techniques. Specific opportunities to replace existing method with targeted or broad which is non-targeted NGS were also highlighted. For example, for rodent antibody production tests, such as the mouse, hamster, and rat antibody production tests, or using non-targeted NGS to replace in vivo assays and in vitro assays. This also meets the intent of the global objective to replace, reduce, and refine the use of animal testing in the in vivo assays. It is important to note that head-to-head -head comparisons of NGS with existing method is not recommended for both in vivo and in vitro testing. A new section on molecular methods is also being added under recommended virus detection and identification assays in the section 3 on cell line qualification. This section comprises two subsections for nuclear acid amplification techniques and NGS. For nuclear acid amplification techniques, which is also referring to as NAT, such as PCR-based methods are typically used singly or in multiplex format to detect viral sequences from known viruses or known closely related virus family and may be used for virus-specific detections, for example, the antibody production test. NAT should be appropriately validated for their intended use, which includes method validations and matrix-specific verifications wherever applicable. Now, let us take a closer look at NGS, which is also known as high-throughput sequencing with demonstrated capabilities for broad virus detection. It can provide defined sensitivity and breadth of viral detection. Use of NGS can be considered for characterizations of the cell line or testing of the cell bank, virus seed, or unprocessed bulk harvest. This can be particularly useful in case of assay interference because of lack of effective neutralization of the viral vector or toxicity caused by the product or media components. A further elaboration on several critical steps in the NGS workflow for considerations when applying NGS are presented in the revised guideline as well. For example, the need of sample pretreatment and virus enrichment steps. Next. NGS is considered a limit test, which means that 
method validation or qualification should consider the detection limit and specificity. Method validation requires predefined performance criteria, while method qualification only evaluates the performance characteristic of the method. As such, suitable reference materials should be used for method qualification and validation to evaluate performance of the different steps involved in the workflow and to demonstrate sensitivity, specificity, and breadth of virus detection. A comprehensive viral database should be used with diverse viral sequences for broad virus detection, and matrix-specific verification should be performed when used as replacement or supplementary methods. Finally, testing flexibility are described in the revised guideline for well-characterized cell line, for example, the CHO cell line. Specifically, chemical induction studies need not be performed for endogenous retroviruses, and in vivo testing is not necessary for extensively used, well-characterized cell line based on prior knowledge. I would also like to share a couple of updates associated with in vitro advantageous virus tests. For qualification of the master cell bank, working cell bank, and cells at the limit of in vitro cell age, LIVCA, 28 days testing on permissive cells should be performed with at least one sub passage at two weeks. The indicator cell culture should be monitored for cytopathic viruses, hem absorbing and hem agglutinating viruses consistent with existing regional regulations and guidance. Advantageous virus testing should be routinely applied to each unprocessed bulk. This testing may include in vitro assay using several indicator cell lines or non-targeted NGS. The indicator cell culture should be observed for 28 days including at least one sub-passage at two weeks Assay duration may be reduced with justification to 14 days for cell lines based on risk assessment, considering the self-substrate, cultivation period for production, use of animal-derived raw materials or reagent, and level of viral clearance of the process. Additional clarification is also provided in the revised guideline on LIVCA, which stands for the limit of in vitro cell age, and end of production cells, EOPC. LIVCA cells are derived from production cells at or beyond in vitro cell age by expansion of the master cell bank or working cell bank. LIVCA cells may be also referred to as EOPC or extended cell bank ECB and these terms can be used interchangeably. Turning our attention to key update 3 on the application of prior knowledge, where we will focus on resin reuse first. In the revised guidelines, it is noted that product-specific viral clearance studies with used resin are not expected for protein A affinity capture chromatography. Accumulated prior knowledge suggests that viral removal is either unaffected or slightly increased with used chromatography resin. It is important to note that prior knowledge might also be able to apply to other chromatography types involved in viral clearance, for example, the N-ion exchange chromatography, AEX, or cation exchange chromatography, the CEX, etc. Equivalent prior knowledge, including in-house experience and a detailed justification should be provided in lieu of product-specific viral clearance studies with end-of-lifetime resin. Having discussed the application of prior knowledge in resin reuse, let's now explore its broader application in evaluating virus clearance. First of all, prior knowledge should reflect literature and the specific experience from the marketing application holder, which includes internal knowledge, for example, the development and manufacturing experience of the company, external knowledge such as scientific and technical publications, including vendor data, literature or peer-reviewed publications, as well as the established scientific principles in chemistry, physics or engineering. 
the important considerations to establish robust viral clearance and use of prior knowledge is provided in the new section 6.6 .6 of the revised guideline. Specifically, the operating conditions must be similar and well understood. The composition of the product intermediate must be representative of the intermediates used in the virus clearance studies or demonstrated not to have an impact. When deriving a reduction factors claiming use of prior knowledge, the claim should be justified considering all reduction factors from the relevant platform data. A conservative reduction Factor claim is advised to avoid the risk of overestimating the reduction capacity of the process step. Examples of the application of prior knowledge are also provided in the newly introduced Annex 5, which I will go into greater depth in the next slide. The new Annex 5 introduced the concept of platform validation, which is defined as the use of power knowledge, including in-house experience, referring to the applicant-owned data, with viral clearance from other products to claim a reduction factor for a new similar product. Examples for applications of power knowledge to XMLV for the process steps dedicated to virus clearance are provided in the annex. This include the inactivation by detergent, low pH treatment, and viral filtration. The annex summarizes process parameters and their potential criticality for the respective process step and suggests how the platform validation approach could be applied. For instance, detergent concentration Temperature and incubation time are critical process parameters for inactivations by detergent when applying the platform validation approach. Similarly, for low pH treatment, pH, incubation time, temperature, as well as buffer matrix will be important operating parameters and conditions when considering applying the platform validation approach. For viral filtration, the annex focus on small virus retentive filters as they are more commonly used. Given the size-based mechanism of action and industry's experience of robust complete retrovirus removal with small virus retentive filters, company could use their in-house data from parvavirus and large viral removal to build a platform large viral clearance claim for commonly used small virus retentive filters. When designing the platform data, it is important for us to have a clear understanding of process conditions such as the volumetric filter load, the pressure and flow, as well as the brain and model of viral retentive filter. If using power knowledge and in-house experience from other products to claim power virus removal, at least one confirmatory product-specific validation run using a power virus should be performed considering worst-case condition. It should be emphasized that these are only examples provided for illustration purposes and they should not be used as a template or sole basis for a regulatory submission. Now we have covered the three key updates in revision 2 for ICHQ5A, let's move to our last key updates on continuous manufacturing. Before we discuss further on these key updates, it will be important to understand what continuous manufacturing is. Unlike batch processing, continuous manufacturing involves the continuous feeding of input materials into a manufacturing process comprised of a series of link unit operations that transform the feed and provide a continuous stream of an output material, which is the product. It can be applied to some or all unit operations of a manufacturing process. The figure on the right in the slide shows an example of a drug substance continuous manufacturing system for therapeutic proteins. In terms of viral safety, technical aspects for continuous manufacturing may differ from those encountered in batch processing, including approaches of detection and removal of viruses, material traceability, process dynamics, and monitoring frequency for startups or shutdown. 
As such, a new Section 7 on points to consider for continuous manufacturing process is being introduced in this revision to address the specific viral safety considerations. It is designed to read with ICHQ 13. Several aspects you need for continuous manufacturing were also highlighted in this revision. For instance, the potential risks associated with longer cell cultivation duration, where fluctuations in the level of endogenous virus may occur over time in the production culture, so an assessment should be made of the appropriate sampling strategy so as not to affect the dose risk factor calculation for drug product. With respect to the integration of unit operations, the potential risk of each unit operations and the connection between equipment should be assessed to address any effects on the virus reduction capabilities. For example, the use of search or mixing tanks between unit operations to mitigate differences in mass flow rate. The possible diversion and segregation impact whereby a procedure for real-time decision-making shall be, shall be established to determine the effects of the product process disturbance on viral clearance or the contamination on the output material quality and product. Finally, the sample considerations for cell culture and unprocessed bulk was also included. Additionally, the revised guideline also describes specific considerations on a unit operation basis. For instance, under chromatography steps, a batch process could serve as a skill down model with well justified target process conditions such as flow rate, resin load versus column overload, resin cleanability in the case of repeating cycles. Validation of two or more connected chromatography steps may be considered as well. For example, bind and elute mode of cation exchange chromatography and a flow-through mode of an anion chromatography. For connected unit operations, it is an option to evaluate virus clearance using conventional batch skill down model if the operating conditions during manufacturing are adequately reflected with respect to the load material. With respect to viral inactivation steps such as low pH or solvent detergent inactivation, the control of relevant dynamic process parameters should be ensured. For example, pH, the solvent or detergent concentration, homogeneity and mixing, temperature. And care should be taken in evaluating or justifying the effects of skill on the process dynamics and control strategy when a skill down model is applied for inactivation in a dynamic process. Finally, on viral filtration, validation as a batch process could be appropriate if setting of parameters which affect viral clearance do not vary beyond ranges stated in the viral clearance study. Process controls should be defined to allow filter changes and post-use integrity testing while maintaining virus clearance capacity. Before we conclude today's session, I would also like to share about the next step with regards to the finalization of training materials for this new revision. The ICH Implementation Working Group was established in early this year to develop and deliver a training program that will facilitate a unified interpretation and harmonize implementation of ICH Q5AR2. It is important to note that the intention with this working group is not to provide exhaustive training on all aspects of viral safety. Instead, our focus is on the new elements introduced in the revision. Technical details regarding validation of NGS will not be included in this program. However, elements of this technology will be included. Training material will be divided into the following different modules. Module 1 will cover new product types where examples for testing and viral clearance program for new product types will be presented using AAV vector generated by plasmid transfection, AAV vector produced using recombinant vacuolar viruses. Module 2 on pyro knowledge where case studies for applications of prior knowledge on master cell bank virus testing strategy, virus inactivation by low pH, resin reuse virus clearance study will also be provided. Last but not least, 
Module 3 on Continuous Manufacturing that will focus on aspects of viral clearance that are unique to continuous manufacturing, viral clearance validation, as well as establishing testing. This is my last slide and this is the IWG work plan. We are currently at the stage of addressing comments from the constituents review and we expect to finalise the training materials by end of this year in December. Please look forward to the training materials which will be posted on the ICH official website. Thank you all for your time and attention today. Once again, I apologize for not being able to join you in person today, and I hope that you have found value in today's session, gaining a current understanding of the key updates for the ICH Q5 AR2. Thank you.